Welcome, Stefan. Welcome. All right, instructional objective. How can we determine the absolute age of rocks? Uh, do now says, how can you determine the approximate age of rock sample F? Be specific, list the principles. And if you see to the right, you have a diagram. And for those of you that just joined us, we're in the uh, Pear Deck. Please click the link. Uh, today's mini lesson, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about radioactive dating, and then you have an activity we're going to read, annotate, uh, and then answer a few questions uh, on absolute dating. Um, we'll have a short discussion and a summary at the end. Remember, uh, report cards are, uh, are going to be going out next week, and the last day of the marking period is this Friday. Give you guys a minute to answer that question. All right, so let's take a look at some of these answers. Uh, first, figure out what's the oldest layer, the very last layer, then go up from there. You can determine the approximate age of a rock sample by using relative dating, comparing to different rocks. Principle of superposition, right? That's the one that tells us that the oldest is on the bottom. Relative dating. Uh, I'm just reading through some of the answers that people posted. You can determine the approximate age of sample F by using cross-cutting relationships, principle of original horizontality, cross-dating method. Using fossils, that's a very good one. Fossils can definitely, especially index fossils, can give us a definite answer. All right. Uh, I am going to move forward uh, just for sake of time. But thank you for those answers. So today, students will be able to describe how radioactive decay works, explain how radioactive decay is related to radiometric dating, and determine the best type of radiometric dating to use for an object. So on the left here, you can see we have some relative dating. We can see the older's on the bottom and the younger's on the top, but that is not always the best way to do things, because we know layers can sometimes be overturned. Uh, so let's take a look at radioactive dating. So radioactive dating, some elements are unstable, they're radioactive, um, and that brings up, uh, upon us the idea of radioactive decay. So unstable atoms will be changed into more stable ones by losing energy and matter. So if we take a look on the right, we've got carbon-14, which is an unstable isotope. Unstable meaning he's unhappy, doesn't like having all those extra neutrons. Well. To get rid of those extra neutrons or protons or whatever they have that's extra, they literally throw them out. Now they can either transfer it directly into the form of energy, welcome Tiffany, or we could um, just have them fling off a proton or a neutron. And it all depends on the type of element we're talking about, but it goes from unstable to stable. Now what can affect this rate of decay? Absolutely nothing. It's not affected by external forces, heat, pressure, gravity. The rate is constant. The measurement uh, of this breakdown gives us an accurate representation of specimen age. Welcome. We are in Pear Deck today, so please click the link. So I want you to take a moment and answer this question. I want you to compare and contrast. How does the absolute, uh, how does absolute dating, as we now know it, differ from the concept of relative dating that we learned about last week? And possibly, try to answer, how are these concepts similar? Okay, just looking at a couple of these answers coming in, absolute dating is accurate when relative dating is not as accurate. Absolute dating is more specific. Yeah, that's really the big key takeaway from this. I'll give you another minute. All right, let's wrap this one up. Yeah, most people are saying really the big difference is that absolute dating is a numerical age or it's a more accurate, a more reliable age. Whereas relative dating goes kind of on um, guessing and um, inferring based on its relative position. Very good. So that brings us to the concept of half-life. So what exactly is half-life? Essentially, it's the amount of time it takes for half of that unstable material to change into a more stable material. An example that we have here is carbon-14. When carbon-14 transmutes or changes into nitrogen-14, or decays into nitrogen-14, it's all the same thing, that takes about 5,700 years. Now, you can find that number in your reference table, so you don't have to memorize it, but we know that our half-life 
is set. It is fixed. It will always take 5,700 years for C14 to turn to N14. Uh, now we have a short video clip I want to show you. Okay, so I stopped it there. Uh, basically, it comes down to the idea that, yeah, it cuts in half each time. So every 5,700 years, it's going to cut in half progressively, time after time again, until eventually you're left with essentially two atoms. We have two atoms, one will disappear, and then that's it, it's gone. So it's kind of like taking a calculator and just dividing by two. You could keep doing it for what seems like an infinite amount of time, but eventually, uh, for all effective purposes, we will run out of elements, right? We will run out of that uh, radioactive parent isotope. And just like as the video was saying, the daughter isotope will grow as the parent isotope drops off. So I have a question for you. An element has a half-life of 2,500 years. After one half-life, keyword is half-life, what percent of the original radioactive material will remain? Last chance for this. An element has a half-life of 2,500 years. After one half-life, what percentage of the original radioactive material will remain? And yeah, exactly 50%. 50%, so your answer should have been half. So which isotopes are you going to use? So if you take a look on the right, you have a uh, chart from ESRT page 1, or Science Reference Table page 1. You've got carbon, potassium, uranium, and rubidium. They use all of these in the questions that they give you, but the most common ones by far are carbon-14 and uranium. Now, carbon-14, something you need to know about it. It's good for dating young organic material. The squirrel that died in your backyard last year. The deer carcass that died, the deer that died 20,000 years ago. The first humans, you might want to use carbon-14. But if you go much further back than, um, let's say, a couple million years, and even a million years might be a stretch, what you really want is something that has a longer half-life. So if you see your carbon-14 is 5.7 times 10 to the third, which is the same as 5,700 years, you'll also notice that carbon-14 decays into nitrogen-14. U-238, it's better for dating old material. For example, the earliest life on Earth in, the, in extremely old rocks, uh, U-238 turns into uh, 206 um, PV, which is lead, and that takes 4.5 times 10 to the ninth, or 4.5 billion years. So you can see young stuff is carbon, old stuff is uranium. Another practice question. A sample of C14 has a half-life of 5.7 times 10 to the third. If you remember scientific notation, we know that's 5,700 years. After three half-lives, what percentage of that original C14 will remain? I got in trouble uh, today with the access. But uh, if we take a look at our answers here, yeah, 12.5%. So again, how does that work? Start off with 100%, cut it in half once. That's our first half-life, we're at 50%. Cut it in half again, we're at 25%. Cut it in half again, we're at 125 So all particles decay. No matter how small a particle is, its rate of decay will remain constant. There's nothing you can do to change it. You could throw it out a window, set it on fire, hit it with a truck. It will always decay at the same rate. Now, some substances decay quick and some go slow, but that's really the main difference. Here's another one. What is the half-life of this diagram, this mystery substance? So how long did it take? Very good, Tara. 15 minutes. So if you follow along from the uh, where it says half the first value, you come across, you hit the line, and you come down. Take a look at where it says quarter of the first value. That's two half-lives. Because if you cut something in half twice, you're left with a quarter. And you move across, you go down 30 minutes. So our half-life is 15. So to go over the concept again, and you're going to read through this in detail. I'm just going to go through it quick for lack of time. Um, to determine the actual age of fossils and rocks, scientists often 
examine radioactive decay. These are known as isotopes. Isotopes have different numbers of protons and neutrons. Most isotopes are stable, some are not. The ones that are unstable are called radioactive, and we use those for data. How does this work? Begin with an unstable element. Break it down over time. Well, it breaks down over time into its daughter isotope. The rate of this decay is constant. Can't change it. To get a date, we're going to compare the ratio of parent to daughter. The more daughter material, the older the sample. And that was today's lesson in a nutshell. Here's another example. We got this snail-like creature. He dies, become a fossil. Researcher finds him, burns it. When you burn it, you're releasing the carbon. The carbon is then split into that uh, separate groups to see how much nitrogen and how much carbon you have. And then you can estimate the age. Again, I want to reiterate this, uranium lead method, old, old things. Carbon, nitrogen method, young, young things. And lastly, we have our final exit slip. How do we know that after 5,700 years, half of the original carbon-14 will remain? Also, what does that remaining C14 turn into? I'm sorry, what does that remaining 50% turn into? Okay, and I'd like to bring your attention to the Google Classroom. So if you go to today's uh, assignment, you can see here that we have two things. We have our notes from today. That's a copy of our notes. You have a PDF sheet that includes all the vocabulary that you are responsible for. And you have a Quizlet. So you're going to click through onto the Quizlet and you're going to do the flashcards. You have today's assignment. You have a short video clip to watch. And you have a reading assignment. Very short but I would like you to do some annotations. So we're going to annotate the passage below, underline key words, circle key ideas, and write down any questions you have. Uh, the first question I'll do with you, it says use the data in the table above to complete the following chart, number of years after formation. So this one was for radium 226. If you'll notice radium 226 is right here, 1,600 years, after 1,600 years, we have 50%. After 3,200, we'll have 25%. Very good. After 6,400, that's right, 12,5. And then again, after another um, 1,600. So you just basically, each time you go through the list, you're putting it in half. Very good, Theo. All right, and answer your last two questions, and that is it for me. Uh, I'm going to be hanging out on here until my next class starts, uh, so you got about 20 minutes. Uh, if you need anything, any questions, please let me know. Um, the, I just want to also remind you, we do have tutoring today from 3 until 4, um, so there's that. When you do um, 